What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi Fruit Loop. How are you? Um, hanging in there. How are you? I'm tired. So I got I got to tell you why I'm tired. But first, we want to give a big shout out to our sponsor, Two Cool T-Shirt Quilts. If you look behind me on YouTube, you can see two of her pillows. The Clemson one's not propped up. Kind of like our season. It's leaning a little bit this year. It's leaning. It was bad. So it's going to be the holidays, guys. And I think if you want to give somebody something really sentimental, this is the way to go. So go to www.twocooltshirtquilts.com slash pretty lies and alibis. And what, Fruit Loop? They can take your t-shirts and make them into a quilt that is too cool. Yeah. So what about this missing series? It's been really good. We got some really good responses out of it. We, yeah, was, you guys are loving it. Yeah. So yeah. every Saturday, as long as there's no catastrophe in our lives, we are hoping to feature one missing person, maybe two, depending on if there's not a lot of information. So, yeah, thank you guys. And we appreciate all the suggestions. We're taking them and making notes. You would not believe the number yeah. of suggestions that we've had to cover. So I this evening, I we're kind of late. We didn't think we would get one in today because yeah. we just, like my house was at a point where I had to stop what I was doing. But so I just got back from helping my 87-year-old grandma put up her Christmas tree. And so my daughters were with me and she said, hey, will you, will you help me move your grandpa's bed? She didn't like the way it was positioned. He's been dead for almost five years, but his little room's still the same. They slept in separate rooms because he snored too much. Super cute. Man, I'm gonna tell you, she she's sweet as pie. But when you're moving furniture, an inch to the left, nope, <laughs> too far. A Wait, you're not listening to me. And my girls have never seen their grandma like that. They were dead. That's funny. Move to the left. Then a few nights ago, I about died of death. I had a big. I'm going down this this kind of slow road. It's it's dark because it gets dark at like four thirty. Yeah, and daylight of, savings time. Still. Oh my gosh, it's crazy. We need to do away with it. Yeah. But so out of the corner of my eye, like I have the LED headlights on my Jeep or whatever, they're really bright. And I see two eyes. And then before I know it, there's a deer running in front of my Jeep. And it's a big, what's well, a doe? Doesn't have the big horns. And if that thing had not jumped over the hood of my car, like a reindeer going in front of my car, we would have hit. <clears throat> I can't imagine. So, you know, that's a difference in elk. So, when in New Mexico, when elk stand, elk will stand and not run, but deer dart. Well, I mean, you know, I've seen the meme that says a deer in the woods hears a stick break and they run in the other mm -hmm. direction and then headlights run right for them. I, I almost had to pull over. I was shaky. But we had a moment where we made eye contact and he Dude, was just... You got Elmer Fudd hunting you in the woods, you're going to run. <laughs> And then, so I've been up since 3.30, and Sherlock is to blame for this one. So I wake up, and it, it almost sounds like club music. It's like, mm, 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 mm. and I'm like, <laughs> what is going on? And the cat just pukes all over my comforter. So I had to go outside at 3 o'clock this morning, 3.30, and get the hose pipe and wash this off because it was everywhere. So... I, that started off my day of deep cleaning. Yeah, you know, you just cause everybody to say, "What is a hose pipe?" So oh, in the yeah, south, sorry, we call not... we don't call it a hose; we call it a hose pipe. Yeah, garden hose or what? Yeah. Whatever. Yeah, hose is what they call it up north. If you put hose pipe, they make fun of you. I used to get made fun of all. The yeah. Time. Well, there you go. We'll probably get made fun of. So there we're we go. In... <laughs> um, yeah. So we just want to update real quick about some hearings that are going to be happening. Chad has three hearings on December the 2nd. So at 9 a.m. on the 2nd, there's going to be a motion for the court to allow additional evidence and follow IC 19-1816 by transporting the jury. I'm going to tweet out what that is because there's I've got it pulled up. I didn't put it on here. And at one o'clock the same day, a motion for discovery concerning events. And we're going to get into this filing by prior in just a second. And then 2.30, we're going to find out when this trial is going to happen. Wow. That's all I care about. 
I'm not worried about any of this other stuff. So let's talk about these new filings. So what Pryor's asking for is an evidentiary hearing about the call that Lori made to the attorney at the um, urging of her, one of her mental health care professionals. And he wants to call Rob Wood, this McConkey lawyer, and the employee in question to testify. And he wants these witnesses to be sequestered or kept in a hotel or other location so that they can't talk. And he says the chance to question these witnesses under oath is imperative. Okay, two of these three witnesses are like, uh, I mean, one's yeah. an attorney. Well, they're both attorneys, but one's prosecution and one's an attorney. And I mean, I understand the other one, but. Yeah, I, I mean, that's what he's asking for. And he's also asking for the court to appoint a special prosecutor that's non-LDS for this, which I thought was kind of weird. I, I mean. I don't, I, I, I can't understand. Yeah. I mean, how can you, know, you, that's like going before a judge and choosing race and religion. I don't, how yeah, that that's, that's kind of my point is that you can't discriminate based on somebody's religion. Right. Exactly. And here we are non LDS prosecutor, special prosecutor. So he doesn't want anything from this to be sealed. And he asked the prosecution not to make any statements to the press about the matter. He doesn't want it sealed, but he doesn't want him saying anything. Well, and here's the thing, too, is Rob Wood and Lindsey Blake put out a joint statement, essentially, where they said that they weren't going to talk about this in the press. Yeah. But, I mean, again, you have on November 4th, you have Mark Means tweeting out um, a little gif of somebody sweeping something under the rug. This is it's like a guy with a broom and the rugs lifted up. And I'm, I'm just sitting here thinking if we want to lay out who has went to the used social media and things like that, it's been Mark means. Yeah. It hasn't yeah. been Rob Wood or Lindsay Blake. Definitely on the defense side. Yeah. So anyways, but yeah, they don't want it sealed. And he said, if these allegations are true, the prosecution's failure to immediately disclose to the court the state's deliberate intrusion into the attorney-client relationship and the fact that resulting information was then fed back to the state represents troubling departure from the professional and ethical obligation of the prosecution, particularly in a capital case. I'm going to call it. He going to ask for death to be removed. Yeah. Bet you a dollar. Yeah. It's so just, what else is... Oh, go ahead. It just doesn't make any sense. Like, Rob Wood called. Yeah. Like he called and told him, look, this. you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. so he also said, since Chad and Lori are co-defendants, it also implicates Chad's due process, fair trial, and effective assistance of counsel. He says broad discovery, and they've used that term 10 million times. Yeah. Right. Broad discovery is also appropriate due to the magnitude of the allegations. Pryor argues it is unquestionable that a state hospital employee entrusted with caring for an incompetent defendant is a government actor. Yeah. And that's just a little bit. I tried to kind of pull the most. I have literally seven pages of notes on this filing. And then I thought mm, it ain't worth it. Yeah. So that's essentially what he wants. But the prosecution filed something last Wednesday, not relating to this, but about the jury. What did they, what did they have to say? So they were asking that the jury be brought in from Ada County. Uh, shortly before the hearing for change of venue, Wood asked the judge to allow this. And Pryor said he would need more time to prepare his side since this was just a few days before the hearing. Boyce said the state could submit the facts at a later time, but he ended up ruling to move the trial and said it was impractical to bring a jury in. So the state says it would be less money to bring the jury in instead of taking the whole trial to Ada County. That's going to cost a lot of money. It's going to, you know, I understand their side of this because you're bringing in, I mean, they're going to have alternate jurors, so it'll be more than 12, but you're talking about the entire court staff. You're talking about witnesses. You're talking about investigators that are going to potentially testify several times during all this. I mean, I understand what they're saying, but at the same time, I just don't think that like risking an appeal down the road, I don't know. 
Yeah, so the whole court staff will have to have somewhere to live in Ada County during the trial, which could be two months or more. Uh, the prosecution is also worried about manpower shortages in the prosecutor's office and law enforcement. They said it could cause a backlog of cases and having to move things around to house this trial, which I totally agree. Yeah, I think as it, big it, as this is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's not like they're moving it a couple of counties over. Mm -hmm. They're moving it hours away. And that's, I mean, so I get what they're saying. So we're going to pick up real quick. We're not going to do super long tonight, maybe 10 or 15 minutes on this, but we're going to pick up with the Chandler document dump. And I believe this is part 10. We're doing Melanie Gibbs. Uh, finally finished making the notes on this, but so we left off where they were talking about the purse and when Charles took her purse and then, they run into J or Melanie Gibbons into Jason Mao. He suggests going to the police. So that's kind of where we are. So pick him back up there. The officer asked again about the box of clothes that Lori took to Goodwill. And Melanie said she thought that was out of kind of out of control. And she asked Lori if she thought this was a little extreme and she did not. So the investigator asked about Lori's behavior when she was telling the police officer about getting rid of his clothes. And Melanie said she remembers Lori being upbeat and she said, I'm sure you've seen the video. Well, now we all have. And she said she can't go back and watch it because she didn't want to see herself in that video. And she's also mm -hmm. tired of seeing herself on TV. But the thing is, with that, she voluntarily did a lot of sit-down interviews. Yeah, she I mean, did. You can't Nate. Dateline, maybe? Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't do a rain dance and cry when it rains. Yeah. You know? So the investigator asks about Julie C. And this is Julie Clement from what we've learned. And when asked if she's still friends with her, she said that not anymore. And she was only a little bit of friends with her. It was more Zulema that was close to this Julie girl. And they knew they both do energy work. So that's how they met each other. And they ask if Melanie has ever attended any prayer circles. And she said a few times that, that she had. And they asked about the one in August after Charles was murdered and she was at that one. So she said it was her, her, ex, I guess, ex-husband, David, Melanie Pulowski, Alex, this Julie Clement, Zulema, Chad, and Lori were all at this prayer meeting, you know, shortly after Charles's murder. And Chad brought out the seer stone, which if you remember, that helps him to get revelations and visions or whatever. And Melanie said she didn't know what it does but it tra you know, translates and receives revelations. She said he didn't say anything about the stone. She just saw it. So investigators ask if she remembers any talk at that prayer circle about Eplos. And she says, possibly. And then she says, Charles was already dead, right? So I don't think they would have talked about that. And the investigator said, Julie said something about a dragon. And Melanie said she didn't have any of their visions and she doesn't do energy work. So all that's in their department. I'm telling you, dude, dragons, magic, comparing yourself to Harry Potter. They got an okay. obsession. Okay, I ain't gonna lie. Uh, this place we went this weekend had a big pendulum hanging. In. I got a picture of it. I took a picture. I forgot to tell you. Yeah, I thought of Chad. I was like, uh oh. Oh, Chad, yeah. I went to my hippie know? store and they have pendulums, and I was gonna bring one and show you, but I was like, I ain't gonna use it. It's gonna waste my money. Nope. So she remembers Julie and Zulema. Uh, had a thin veil and they saw a dragon in their prayer. If they were in that little circle saying a prayer, she doesn't know why Iplos would be mentioned if Charles is already dead, which we just talked about a little bit. The investigator asked if there was a reason behind the prayer circle. And she says she remembers Zulema speaking and she tries to remember if they were talking about certain people to help get the spirit out of the bodies. She's trying to remember who they were focusing their energy on. And she said it could have been Brandon, but it wouldn't have been Tammy. So she thinks it was Brandon, but she's not 100%. Then she said maybe she was talking about the earth. She said it was so out there. She said David, her boyfriend at the time, was so uncomfortable. And I think she says that like three times. Mm -hmm. She repeats it kind of over and over. Yeah. When asked how well she knew Zulema, she said she didn't talk to her after Melanie said she was going to the police. They were friends in the ward and knew each other for about a year. 
He asked if she knew how long Zulim and Alex were dating, and she said it didn't really happen until right at the end. She said Zulema was content being single, but Chad and Lori told her that she and Alex had been married in previous lives, and they would be a part of the 144000 if you get married and move to Idaho. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> right. Zulema said she wasn't getting the same answer, and there was tit for tat between Zulema and Lori about that. Zulema was waiting to get answers, and Melanie said at one point, right at the end, she said Lori and Chad were in Hawaii, and her and Alex did a blessing over the phone because they were being attacked by Julie Rowe through a text, and they saw a dragon. Yeah, she was trying not to laugh at this point. I can Melanie see. was. I can see why. <laughs> uh, and Alex Priesthood is so powerful, they helped cast a dragon from Hawaii. I, th I think maybe I meant to put Chad's there. Chad's priesthood is so powerful. Oh, my bad. I was uh, about to say, Alex is priest. He's a priest. Mm. Melanie says they were at dinner in August and they were getting more friendly then. When asked how close she was to Alex, she says friends. Yeah, so she said she would call Alex occasionally and the investigator asked Melanie to describe his dedication to Lori. And she said in the very beginning when they started talking about Joe, Alex was really protective of her and he would describe joe as a horrible person and how he felt the need to to protect her and she remembers and this is her words that alex tased joe and the nads and something about the trunk so alex didn't care if he went to jail for Lori. we all know that and she said later she understood his mindset about protecting Lori because chad told him as they started to get into their crazy doctrine is what she said their crazy doctrine girl, you were right in the middle that in the beginning, Alex was a nobody and had only been on the earth once. We've talked about this before, but later they said he was only on earth for Lori and he didn't need to come here because he was exalted. So we know they told him he was the angel that stopped Lemuel from killing Nephi and Alex believed them and took this on as his identity. I mean, she said he, that was his identity from then. And the investigator asked her if she thought Alex bought all that, and she she did. When he moved, and I'm assuming she's talking about to Rexburg, Lori told him to pray about it, and he did and said he got a confirmation he should go. So she said the last time she saw Alex, she said, this zombie thing, I'm not 100% on that. And Alex said, no, I believe it 100%. And she said, Zulema said she's still getting confirmation on the zombie thing. So... She said he totally believed Chad and Chad gave him this blessing. And the investigator said, that's my next question. Were you there for that blessing or did you ever hear that blessing? And Melanie said, no, but she said that Alex told her Chad gave him a beautiful blessing and he cried like a baby. And he said he never cries. So this was the day Lori and Chad got married, that he got the blessing, cried like a little baby. Oh, my word. Oh, no. So the investigator asked Melanie to describe the patriarchal blessing in her own words. What's the importance? And she said the way she was taught growing up is he is called of God. He gives a blessing to a person about their life. She said Chad sure played that role. She said he was absolutely not authorized to give that blessing. The investigator asked if you got it at a young age, would it be some sort of guidance for you? And Melanie says, yes. It talks about your life the gifts you have, things that may happen in your future if you're obedient. The investigator plays a clip, and it's labeled Patriarchal Blessing, and you hear Chad's voice. He says, this is Chad Daybell. It's November 24, 2019, Sunday afternoon, 5.15 p.m., and I'm going to give Alexander Lamar Cox a Patriarchal Blessing. You hear Lori's voice in the background. Mm -hmm. Boy, he didn't make them work to find out when this blessing was given. <laughs> For real. 24, 15 p.m. and 49 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> ding, ding. Here's a big flashing red light. Here it is. Uh, the investigator asked what her relationship with Chad was like. She said the first meeting was brief. She introduced herself and said she lived in Arizona and said she had some beautiful experiences with the Lord herself. And she probably mentioned she did classes herself. She said he read the forward in her book. She says she sent the picture to Rob. Yeah. And we're assuming that's Rob Wood, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing she probably just sent like a screenshot of yeah. 
her forward. Yeah. Yep. So the investigator says, if you look at the hierarchy of the scores, vibrations, who would you put at the core, the center of this group? And she says, Chad and Maury. Uh, they considered themselves the head of that group. So then the investigator asked if there was a particular name for the group. Dude, don't even says, give me a pause second because I will go there. I paused. I paused. <laughs> and Melanie says no. And people ask if there's a big following. And she said no. She will do the best to describe what she knows. But she says there's lots of other things she doesn't know. She said Chad was so quiet about his life. In Chad's little circle with Lori, there's people she mentioned around the table and there's three other girls that got kicked out of the group, Serena, Christina, and Nicole. It sounds like Charlie's Angels or something. And that <laughs> was at the beginning. Yeah. So when asked why, Mel why Melanie said Serena was calling Chad too much, according to Lori, that's why she got kicked out. And they decided she was, Lori decided she was turning dark and had to go. Cause you're moving well, up like right everybody now. else. You're turning. Right, yeah. Yeah. The minute that you Pain was her, dark, everybody dark. was dark. I know. Right. Yeah. So Christina and Nicole knew Lori actually before Melanie Gibb did, and they were among the first to be ordained as part of the 144,000. They started getting suspicious and Christina, especially because she would call Lori out on things. She would say, you know, Chad's married. And so of course she's turning dark according to Lori. And Melanie said something about, they said Christina wasn't a hundred percent human. And so she's trying to think, and she's, you could tell like Melanie Gibb went to another place and it was some kind of a part lizard. So poor Christina. Here, she's lizard, like a, lizard. Isn't that, is a lizard? That's not a serpent, right? A serpent is a snake. Oh, sorry. Okay. Oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you this. Here comes one of our tangents. I'm sweeping in the house yesterday. Mm -hmm. I go to sweep the corner. There's a snake in your house. Legit in the house, dude. So there's, so the two kids, one's in the bathtub, one's just running around. So I start like, Oh my goodness. And well, little miss would have picked it up. She ran and closed the door. Oh, really? And Normally then when she just... saw it, she squealed and ran away. Yeah, I would too. I would burn the house down and I would be homeless tonight because well, ain't no I way. I proud of myself. I eventually got one of the kids to bring me the dustpan and I pinned it down with a broom and I swept it up in the dustpan and took it outside. Uh, uh dude. I would never close my eyes in that house again. Okay, so how big was it? Well, it was it was just a baby one. It was about about that big. That ain't a baby. It was a little baby king snake. Oh, well, see, I had a copperhead on my porch that no, Sherlock, well, I got a Fu Manchu, had it in his that's mouth. Bad. King snake is good. It'll eat copperheads. Oh, really? Yeah, they're good snakes. Uh-uh. Uh -uh. I got a spare bedroom. You Come on, Fruit Loop. <laughs> if I ever cussed in my life, that would have been the time, and I didn't. Yeah, see, I would have passed didn't. out, and it would have, like, wrapped no. around my neck, and that's how I would have went. Uh -uh. So, anyways, um. Melanie said that that was it as far as the whole zombie talk at this point. So Chad had Julie Rowe, Chad and Julie Rowe were friends, as you know. And, but okay. eventually, he, he, what, I'm sorry, but every time I hear her name, I think of that video with her doing him little. Like, oh yeah, the things that like you do um, yeah. if you're in yeah. what, color guard or something? Yeah, she's in flag. She's in the color guard of the band. Dude, I would not be graceful with that at all. It would be getting wrapped mm -hmm. around my face and mm -hmm. all that stuff. So eventually Chad moved away from Lori, uh, from Julie Rowe. And Lori thinks all this, it, like, I mean, I'm sorry. Melanie Gibb thinks that this little religion or whatever you want to call it comes from, it kind of derived from the energy work. She thinks it's sort of built from there. That's her opinion. So she says, Julie Rowe, between the two, she's trying to remember who started what. And she said, Julie didn't know about the zombie thing. That was all Chad. Either her or Eric Smith, the follower of Julie's, came up with the multiple probation thing. She heard it could have been from this Eric guy, but she didn't know if that was true or not. But Eric did write a, a book on multiple probations. 
So someone in Julie's inner circle contacted Melanie and they were comparing notes and she would hear things Chad had told Lori that seemingly came from Julie. So it sounds like maybe he picked up a little bit of her hogwash and mixed it with his hogwash and, and you just got some murky water. So Melanie said Chad had some power over Lori sexually and the girl said someone did that to her and that's what they do in that group. That's the energy work. So I'm I, I don't know who they sort of insinuate that somebody else said they had a thing with Chad. And I think we all know who that might be, but she didn't know anything about it. Um, so Chad was, was part, you know, being in Julie Rose group, he said he was just getting tired of her, which I mean, I can't imagine like talking to somebody and they whip out one of them things and start, you know, okay. So I've had these multiple probations and, Odd as gods, those people. So when Chad and Lori first met at St. George, he said, he told her, I'm done with Julie Rowe. And she texts me all the time and I'm done with her. Uh-oh. You think there's a good place to stop? Uh, I think if we just finish the rest of this page, it's a really good place to stop. All right, gotcha. I got I got an energy work appointment. No, that's right. You got to go wave your baton around. Yeah. I got so two. Melanie said now there's all these energy groups out there and a lot of them talk about multiple probations. She doesn't think Chad is the founder of any of that. She said Lori wasn't a social butterfly. She didn't want a big crowd. Yeah, she probably, can't control it. Exactly. I was just going to say that. Boom. Yeah. Because you can control a small group of people that are like-minded, but you get, as you see with Christina and Nicole and the other girl, they yeah. question things and they're gone. Yep. yep. So the investigator asked if she thought Lori took instruction from Chad and she said, yes. He asked if Lori would do anything without Chad's authorization. And Melanie said in the beginning, Lori said she felt Chad gave her the priesthood and he told her she was married to Morona. Melanie said he, he would confirm her little things. At one point, Lori said Chad was good at getting revelations. So she would just go to him because she wasn't as good at it as as she used to be. And Melanie uses the example of text investigators have seen of Lori asking Chad, if this person is dark or is that person dark? The investigator asked her if she knew any way Lori would have found out about Charles and Adam's plan to stage an intervention. She said, Charles maybe called or text and said he is coming. And we know that we saw that, that he texted her and said he was going to take JJ to school and all that. She I think said, she had to have found out that Adam was coming, either her mom or her sister. I can't I remember. Summer. Yeah. yeah I, I think, yeah, kind of in there. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a good place to stop just okay. because, girl, I'm tired. Like, I'm going right. to start going crazy here in a minute. I got to get in the bed. Well, it feels like it's like 11 p.m. I know. And it's 835 and it should be midnight. But, you know, when you wake up to... Yeah. At three in the morning, uh -uh. it's been a long day. No, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So anyways, we are going to keep an eye on things. Uh, probably try to fit one in tomorrow if we can. And just keep going with this. And I've decided to go back and rewatch all of Zulemas. So we're going to do this with Zulemas because when we covered that on a previous episode, I had just trusted the summary, which is good. But man, you miss so many little nuggets. I'm just going to take one for the team. This took me days and Zulemas is twice as long, but I'm going to start that tomorrow. We still have a couple of episodes with this and then we've got texts and all kinds of stuff, but we really want to pick it apart Yeah, and take our time with it because <clears throat> I've learned so much doing this. It gives a lot of insight into things and well, you I don't want to miss anything. Thoughts. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So Anyways, somebody said I, I end things too quickly. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> I, so I don't I, I, I don't know. Um, I can do a little song and dance for you. I don't know. It's like, okay, we'll continue to wave and stop as you go to leave. It's like a Southern thing. The Southern like, goodbye. Go now, and then 30 minutes later, you're still, yeah. Well, how about this weather? In the morning, I have to dress like a, you know, I'm in Antarctica. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, then by the middle day, you're peeling stuff off. It's, it's bipolar weather here. Yeah. But it's nice to have 78 degrees in November. Uh, it is, but then the snake gets in your house. Yeah, see, that's a that's a big one, yeah. 
Yeah, I, I just wish there was like a hairball season where they just yeah. don't do it. Like snakes yeah. hibernate. Can we just, oh. Yep. I don't know what he well, It was like one of those things. Like I was sweeping and I was like, uh -uh. Wait a minute. in my brain, I'm like, oh, that's a snake. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it's a snake. <laughs> that scares me about my dog door. Oh, they'll get in there. Oh, it's I know. Cool. We had a possum get in the house one time. Yeah. It's, oh, it's that was a whole thing. Snakes are looking for heat right now. Oh, hush. Yep. They're going to snuggle right up next to you. Uh-uh. I don't know. I'd rather let my dogs tinkle in the house and just shut that off. I know, right? Oh, man. Maybe I should put, right. like, a booby trap down there. Oh, I could put yeah. a glue trap. All right. Yeah, do that. No, then they'll get stuck. That's better All than right. cuddling out with me. All right, guys. We are out of here. Have a good rest of your evening. See you tomorrow.